Morning comes early to the commercial fishing village at Pier 38 in Honolulu. This is the home of the United Fish Agency's Fresh Fish Auction and the final stop for the boats of Hawaii's commercial fishing fleet. It's the only fish auction of its kind between Tokyo and the eastern seaboard of the United States. And the tuna, swordfish, and other pelagic species brought to market here from the surrounding waters are world-renowned for their quality and freshness. It's here on the auction floor, day after day, that fish buyers, representing domestic and international markets, aggressively bid on some of the ocean's most valuable and sought-after catch. One by one, these fish are wild-caught, brought to market, and then distributed across supply lines that end up on the dinner plates of restaurants and households across the continents. When the auction bell rings at the crack of dawn, it's hard to escape the feeling that something big and important is taking place that goes well beyond the livelihoods of those working within the fishing community. After all, nearly 50% of the world's population relies on the ocean as its primary source of protein. Behind each of these fish, there is a story. A story that the average consumer rarely, if ever, has an opportunity to fully experience and appreciate. We can begin to grasp it by watching the action unfold on the auction floor. We can see how it ends up in the seafood sections of our favorite supermarkets. But in order to truly understand this story in its entirety, we must look to the high seas where it all begins and see for ourselves, from the perspective of the fishermen, whose courage and sacrifice make this all possible. Meet Captain Wang Gia'an. He is Hawaii's first Vietnamese swordfish captain and has been fishing for tuna and swordfish in these waters since 1989. His boat, the Jackson T, is one of the biggest and best equipped in the Hawaii fleet. And as if that wasn't enough, he is also a renowned songwriter and poet, with thousands of fans around the world following him on his website, which as of production boasts nearly three million hits. Wang is a larger than life character and I knew he'd be the perfect captain to help me understand and experience the sights, sounds, and adventure of a Hawaii longline fishing trip. In late March, I caught up with Wong at Saigon Pho in Honolulu to talk fishing over a bowl of Chinatown's finest noodle soup. Wong told me that he would be delighted to have me as a guest on an upcoming swordfish trip, and after a thorough briefing on fishing boat safety and a crash course on life at sea, we made plans to embark on an unforgettable journey together. My goal was simple, to experience the seldom seen aspects of the Hawaii fishing industry firsthand, to learn where the fish of the Hawaii fish auction come from, how they are caught, and to personally meet the unsung heroes operating behind the scenes of this high energy industry. Little did I know at the time that I would never again look at the fish section of a market or the menu of a seafood restaurant the same way again. The Jackson Tea leaves Honolulu for sword fishing grounds in the late morning of March 19th. The season is already well underway, and in order to find the elusive fish this late in the game, Captain Wong decides to travel 500 miles to the northwest, where his plan is to intercept the fish as they move south to warmer waters. Wong has supplies to last for up to six weeks out at sea, and he's prepared to spend all of it in order to fill his boat. But after more than three decades of fishing, Wong knows that there are no guarantees in this business. A successful trip takes much more than just hard work and experience to pull off. But to some extent, it comes down to sheer luck, and he's prepared for this as well. As his crew begin to prepare the boat for operation, Wong talks to a few of his fellow captains on the radio. There's a lot of water out here, 
and finding fish in the vast Pacific is not an easy task. By working together, Wong and his fellow fishermen stand a better chance at finding the proverbial needle in the haystack. Three days into the steam out to the grounds, a major problem is encountered, and I see for myself what Wong meant back in Honolulu when he told me that self-reliance, ingenuity, and the ability to improvise are the hallmarks of survival at sea. The boat has run over a cluster of free-floating marine debris in the early hours of the morning, and the large mass of discarded netting and abandoned fishing gear has fouled the boat's propeller, halting all progress towards the fishing grounds. Stranded hundreds of miles from land and unable to maneuver, the Jackson T is at the mercy of the ocean. The propeller must be freed, and in order to do that, someone will have to dive into the 65 degree water and cut away the debris. Only one man aboard possesses the skills and courage needed to complete this feat, and as the Jackson T's crew ready the compressed air tank and fasten the ladder to the stern, Deccan Takoi of Kiribati dons his mask and wetsuit and prepares for his mission. What Takoi is preparing to do is extremely dangerous. Five foot seas and strong currents are just the beginnings of the hazards that Takoi now faces. The water is numbingly cold and one careless mistake could result in disaster for the fishing operation and serious bodily harm for Takoi. Carefully diving to avoid the crushing force of the boat's hull, Takoi latches himself to the propeller structure underwater and begins cutting with the knife tied to his wrist. He must work quickly in order to get as much debris freed as he can before being forced to come up. After 15 minutes of brain-freezing work under the boat, Takoi resurfaces. He is despondent from the cold and must warm himself in the boat's engine room for several minutes before he can even report on progress. The report is not optimistic. Debris remains tightly wound around the boat's shaft connecting the propeller to the engine and will require at least one more dive to fix. With the conditions worsening and the water as cold as it is, time is of the essence. Using my underwater camera equipment, however, Takoi, Captain Wong and I are able to work together to formulate a strategy for removing what remains of the gear. As the boat continues to drift in the swells, Takoi gears up for what we all hope will be his final dive. Captain Wong and the entire crew hold their breath as Takoi disappears once more. No one is making money right now, and unless the problem is resolved, the trip will end early and unsuccessfully. The stakes are high, and everyone is counting on Takoi's abilities to get the Jackson T back on track. The boat's transmission is not designed to operate with rope tied around the shaft and propeller, so nothing can remain. With the debris cut away, Takoi signals to the crew above, who pull it to the surface. When he finally comes up from below, there is a collective sigh of relief, as Takoi indicates he has been successful in removing the debris. This incident could have doomed the entire trip, but through hard work and resourcefulness, not to mention tremendous courage on the part of Takoi, the Jackson T is once again on its way to the grounds and back in a position to catch fish. This incident has been a reminder that out at sea, these fishermen have no one to rely on but themselves, and that failure to deal with the challenges they face can have disastrous consequences. For me, this has been a harrowing experience, but for Captain Wong and his crew, it's just another day at the office. A longline fishing operation is a beautifully simple yet highly efficient setup. Gear is put in the water just after sunset starting with a heavy radio buoy attached to the 4mm monofilament mainline. 
As the boat travels, the line is rolled off the spool and the fishermen regularly snap smaller branch lines as it goes out. Each branch line ends with a large hook baited with a mackerel fish. Fluorescent light sticks are periodically tied on these lines as well to attract fish in the dark of night. It takes several hours for the 40 miles to be set and when it's all done the fishermen grab a few hours of sleep before they begin the haul and see what fish have found their way onto the hooks. It's just after 5 a.m. on March 29th, and Captain Wong and his crew have reached the fishing grounds, set their gear, and are about to begin the first haul of the trip. The gear has been soaking for several hours now, and as the crew suit up for the day's work, a single thought occupies their minds. Will the 40 miles of area covered by last night's set yield fish, or will the Jackson T have to look elsewhere for the means to fill their hold? As the sun begins to rise, the radio buoy is brought aboard, the main line is tied to the spool, and the haul is officially underway. I can barely contain my excitement as the first leaders are retrieved from the main line and coiled into the hook boxes. It's just a matter of time before one of these hooks comes to the surface with a big fish on it. The weather is nice and the crew is settling into a routine, working together to efficiently bring hooks in, coil the branch lines and buoys, and run the boat. Deckhands Day and Chin are working the roller this morning, which means it will be they who first determine that a fish is on. About an hour into the haul, the main line gets tight and the action begins to heat up. Chin slows the boat down as a branch line bearing the weight of a large fish approaches the roller block. Day skillfully unsnaps this leader from the main line and almost simultaneously attaches it to a 30 meter fight line that the crew will use to bring the fish to the boat by hand. A large swordfish is far more powerful than any one of these fishermen alone. So rather than try to overcome the fish by aggressively pulling on the line, they skillfully give and take slack according to the fish's movements. Day and Chin can tell immediately that they are dealing with a large fish, and the whole crew springs to action in order to land it. At this point, the fight has just begun, and if they want to avoid losing the first big catch, they must work together quickly and skillfully. Chin maneuvers the boat while Day and the crew continue to fight the fish from the port side. The fish is thrashing and diving below the surface in a final attempt to free itself. When it finally breaks the surface, the crew quickly secure it with well-placed gaffs to the head and bill area. It's time to exercise some brute strength as the fish is hoisted out of the water and onto the deck. The Jackson T has landed its first fish of the trip, and it's a large sword, just what they're looking for. With the sword on deck, the work is just beginning now. As Takoi sets to work cleaning and dressing the catch, the rest of the crew untangle the gear and get right back to hauling. If they're lucky, they will repeat this process several more times before day's end. As the afternoon comes to a close, Captain Wong is pleased to have caught 2,500... swordfish on his first set. If he can keep up this pace, he'll be headed home by the end of the month with a full boat of fresh fish. The crew celebrate the day's successes by enjoying a bit of the catch for themselves. In a restaurant back home, a table full of fresh swordfish steaks and big eye ahi pokey would fetch many hundreds of dollars. But for the fishermen of the Jackson Tea, it's just one of the perks that come with the job. Tonight, they will set their gear all over again, and in the morning, they hope to match the productivity they saw today. The second haul is off to a quick and promising start. The sun has only begun to rise, and the Jackson T has a massive swordfish on the line. Because it's early in the haul, and this portion of the gear hasn't been in the water very long, the fish has an enormous amount of fight in it. And if Captain Wong wants to land it, he will have to check the fish's energy and strength with technique and skill. The sword 
ground is diving deep now, and at its current pace, it will reach the end of the fight line and easily overcome the crew. In response, Wong orders Day to attach a 10-gallon buoy to the line. The buoy will provide enough resistance to keep the fish from diving further, and it will begin to tire enough for the crew to haul it in. After about 10 minutes, the buoy is recovered and the crew attempt to haul it in. But the fish has not resigned yet. It dives again, this time under the boat into the starboard side. The crew must quickly bring the fight line around the stern before the fish can drag it against the hull and part the line. After another 15 minutes time, it appears that the fish is finally within reach. As it comes to the surface, the crew at last see the size of the sword they've been fighting. This sword weighs over 600 pounds. Bringing a sword of this size onto the boat is no small feat either. And with the animal still very much alive, it can be extremely dangerous. Using the boat's hydraulic lift, in addition to several well-placed gaffs, they managed to hoist it up and get it on the boat. The day couldn't have started better for the Jackson T, and as I watch in amazement, several more good-sized swords are brought on board. Because the Jackson tea is out at sea for several weeks, preserving the freshness of the fish is of the utmost importance. The buyers back at Honolulu Fish Auction are experts in determining quality, and there's no way around it. To get a good price, the fish must be in excellent condition. Over the years, Captain Wong has developed a method that is quite impressive. After being thoroughly dressed and cleaned on deck, each fish is placed in a large cooler of ice water. This brings its core temperature down to around freezing. Next, each fish is packed in ice in a temporary area of the hold for several hours before being repacked in its final spot. In this manner, when the fish are finally brought to market, Wong can rest assured knowing that he has done all he can to ensure the quality of his catch. Between catching, cleaning, and packing the fish, there is hardly a minute's rest on the deck of the Jackson Tee. As soon as the deck is cleared, more fish are brought on and the process continues all over again. Unlike other jobs, however, where heavy workloads result in complaints and low morale, on a fishing boat, this intense workload is what pays the bills and puts money on the table. Rất là lo lắng không phải, tôi lo lắng lắng riêng bản thân mình tôi, tôi lo lắng nguyên cả nguyên cả anh em, nguyên cả người trên tàu, bất kỳ người nào tôi cũng lo lắng cho nhau hết để được bọc nhau sống với trên thương thương trường và biển. So far, Captain Wong has little to complain about. After a near disastrous start to the trip, he is catching fish. He can only hope that his luck will prevail and he can continue to fill the hole at the current pace. It's been nearly three weeks now, and thanks to good fishing, the Jackson T is ahead of schedule as each set is proving to be more productive than the last. As the crew begin hauling gear for the 20th set, they're in for a few surprises, and so am I. When a branch line comes up bearing tremendous weight, the crew assume it's another big swordfish. When they begin to haul it in, however, they realize that a giant devil ray has found its way onto their gear. With a wingspan of around 8 feet, this gentle giant is truly a wonder of the sea. 
Fortunately, it spits the hook and swims away unharmed. Every one of these fishermen have tales of strange sightings out at sea, and this Devil Ray is just an addition to the existing catalog. As the last branch lines of the set are hauled in, the Jackson T is in for one more surprise. This time, a 400 pound swordfish is hooked, and as it's brought in, its mate is seen swimming free around the boat. Swordfish can be extremely aggressive. They have been known to attack the boats that have hooked them, and since they often travel in pairs, the mates have been observed swimming around their hooked partner. This is rarely if ever documented, however, and it's exciting to see firsthand. Though a bit more common for the fishermen of the Jackson T, I'm still very impressed by the size of some of the Mako sharks that end up on the gear. The Jackson T does not keep sharks on board, and instead cuts them free. But the 12-footer caught on the last set did not need any help freeing itself. In fact, it did a remarkable job, thanks to its hundreds of razor-sharp teeth and tremendous body strength. Being in close proximity to such a beautiful and powerful creature, and one with so many teeth, allows me to appreciate being on the boat all the more. It's now nearly the end of April, and Captain Wong has nearly filled his boat. A few more good sets and he'll be headed in, hoping for a high market price and a good end to his trip. It's been four weeks of fishing out on the high seas. The fishermen of the Jackson Tee have worked virtually non-stop during this time in weather conditions varying from beautiful to quite rough. Day after day, they have set their hooks, hauled them in, and worked hard to board their catch. I asked Day what it's like to work out here on the high seas, and I'm impressed with his outlook on this demanding way of life. Day is certainly right about one thing. It feels great to be headed home. After over a month on the high seas and with a boat full of swords, spirits are high and the energy is palpable on board the Jackson T. The crew prepare a final feast and kick back for a bit, at last able to relax and enjoy themselves. It takes several days to return to Honolulu from the fishing grounds, and Captain Wong is eager to know how strong the swordfish market has been this week. A difference in price of just a few cents per pound can make a big difference when dealing with tens of thousands of pounds. As the Jackson T makes port and prepares to offload their catch, tensions are high once again as Captain Wong awaits the auction bell. We're back at the United Fish Agency auction where it all began six weeks earlier. This time it's the Jackson T that's selling, and I feel a special connection to the fish I see here on the auction floor. After all, I was there as each of these fish were caught and brought on board. I sincerely hope that Captain Wong will get a good price for his catch, and I'm happy that at this point he seems optimistic. Well, I'd be happy about $5. I'd be happy. And I hope for $4. This stuff, four dollar. That mean, that mean, you know, maybe they go sit down. Last week, yeah. only today they start five dollar, yeah. and they go to five dollar ten. 
I believe maybe six dollar fifty. You know, because it takes long time. Now, like, take long time. Now, you know how much that? Five dollar forty. Five dollar forty. The demand for fresh seafood is as high as it's ever been. And as long as buyers continue to show up each morning to bid on the day's catch, captains like Wong and boats like the Jackson T will be headed back out to try their luck on the high seas. It's been a privilege to have experienced what life is like for the fishermen who are responsible for supplying the market and to have seen firsthand where these fish come from and how they're caught. Wong is an exemplary captain with a tremendous amount of respect for the ocean that sustains his livelihood. It's truly been an unforgettable experience. Oh, we're fishermen work too hard. But sometimes we don't know the market. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. But the job, we have to keep going, keep going. You know, we have to work all the way. Thank you.